Welcome back. So with this lecture, we're starting on early modern English, and we'll start with some of the outer history focusing on culture and technology. There is another lecture that we'll see um, coming up that will focus on some other aspects of the outer history as well, um, linking a little bit more closely to some linguistic awareness during this time period. So the early modern English period happened from around 1500 or so to around 1800 or so. Um, so this time period starts at the beginning of where the printing press comes in um, and is the first period of time where English speakers are really starting to take a serious look at their language. This is what we um, sometimes refer to as the golden age of literature. Um, there's a lot of writers that start becoming much more self-conscious of their language usage during this time as well. And there's a lot of cultural, political, and technological influences that are happening during this time. So some of the major things that are affecting this time period are the introduction and the dissemination of printing. So we get the introduction of the printing press at the end of the Middle English period, which sort of marks the beginning of this early modern time period, especially as printing starts taking off and becoming disseminated more widely. This is also the period of the Renaissance, um, we see the Protestant Reformation taking place during this time period. Um, the enclosures are also happening, um, the Industrial Revolution. This is also the age where we start seeing a vast expanse of exploration and colonization taking place. And the end of this time period is usually marked by the American Revolution and the sort of split of English um, into different national Englishes. So we'll go through each of these individually and we'll start with printing. So printing is something that started at the end of the 1400s. So in 1476, William Caxton introduced printing as a new craft in England. He was a middle-class merchant who ended up having a really big influence on the country because of bringing over printing um, to England. And the contribution of this made it possible to start producing and distributing uniform books in very large quantities. So rather than scribes having to write everything out by hand and not having lots of copies of things, we see for the first time that there's a wide ability for many people to get their hands on printed materials, on things that they can read, so literacy starts increasing dramatically as a result of this during this time. This is also the first time that the profession of writing actually becomes possible. So rather than just uh, scribes and rather than just people that are in monasteries and people linked to religion and highly educated people, um, having access to a literate system, having access to writing, a lot more people are able to start writing during this time period. There was an initial obstacle of a lack of standardization, so widespread accessibility was still difficult early on, but this changes um, as things become more standard, um, and we'll see some of those um, changes and some of the effects of printing on standardization. Some of the problems with early standardization was largely because the people that were sort of in charge of starting this process weren't very good at knowing what things to do for standardization. So Caxon himself was not trained in letters. He went to Germany when he was around 50 to learn printing and then brought it back in 1476, opened up a press shop in Westminster in the London area. <clears throat> and spent the rest of his life um, sort of creating and issuing some books, um, among them authors including Chaucer and Lydgate. And he wrote prologues to some of his books. It was very clear through his writing that Chaucer was his hero. So a lot of things will affect Chaucer's writings and printings a little bit differently during this time period. Caxton had distinct ideas of what was seen as courtly language and what was not. Um, so he would revise some earlier things for press, um, so certain, certain writers, and he would alter words that were used. He would leave sentence structures unchanged. So there was a lack of uniformity that was happening with some of these things that Caxton was doing. We also see that when Caxton is putting foreign words into text, it's sort of suggested by the original text. So we see tumble coming from French tomber. Um, borrowings were rarely part of his own vocabulary, though, and so he would sort of alter some old-fashioned words in other authors, but he wouldn't change them in Chaucer's writings. Um, and he would often complain that English was a difficult language for serious literature. So this is something that was a bit of an anxiety during the time that English didn't have the kind of power at the beginning of standardization, at the beginning of the printing press, um, and it wasn't seen as the sort of serious language for writing, the same as something like Latin would have been during this time. Um, he also varied a lot of things in time and space and style and spelling. Um, and this was something that wasn't just a problem with Caxton. This is something we found with other authors at the time as well. But Caxton would use different spellings. Um, so book with B-O-O-K-E and B-O-K-E for our present day English book. 
Eggs had different spellings as well in his different writings. So his inconsistencies tended to be influenced in part by what he was translating. So a lot of what he was putting into English were translations and he would spell things differently depending on which language it came from. So words like music and magic would end with a Q-U-E if it was coming from French, but it would end with a K if it was coming from German. So he would spell things differently based on the language that he was pulling from. And sort of his ignorance and lack of experience in some of these practices that professional English scribes would have had created actually more variation in spelling during this beginning time period rather than less. It was only decades later that printers really started contribute, uh, contributing to the standardization of spelling. So some of the effects that printing ended up having is that spelling did become more standardized and as this happened, printing was responsible for freezing that spelling in time. So this freeze of standardization, this freeze of spelling took place right before the major sound change in early modern, Eng um, in early modern English of the great vowel shift was being completed. So the present day English spelling ends up representing the sounds that we would have seen from the early modern English of around the 15th century or so. This, this also ended up increasing literacy. It increased demand for books resulting from the printing press, especially among middle and lower classes that wouldn't have been educated prior, wouldn't have been literate prior. They now had access to things that they didn't previously have access to. So there were lots of requests for translations from French and Latin because the lower classes weren't highly educated. They didn't read French, they didn't read Latin. So lots of loan words ended up being introduced during this time period as well from French and Latin because of this translation and because of the borrowing that took place as these translations were taking place. This also gave aspiring authors a chance to actually make a living at being a writer. Um, so contemporary Western civilization is often seen as a child of the printing press. Without the printing press having taken place, and especially when it took place, we wouldn't be seeing the kinds of effects that we see today um, and the influence that Western society and Western civilization has had on other areas of the world as a result of printing. The next major phase that took place during this time would be the Renaissance, and the Renaissance marked a revival of interest in classical learning. So there was an interest in translations of much older authors, um, historical authors like Caesar and Plato and Ovid and Homer, um, that were really only ever in Latin prior to the 15th century. So it wasn't until the printing press happened that these were translated into English and that there was a need and a desire for these works to actually exist in English. Um, a lot of the religious works of the time, things like Calvin and Martin Luther, were also in Latin and ended up being translated into English um, by the 16th century as well. This was a time for English authors to also start developing a sophisticated English style. So this increased the role that English played because we were sort of increasing the ways that English was being used. We see this in more scenarios than we were seeing it prior. Um, this incorporated a lot of features of classical rhetoric comparable um, that was compatible with English. English was already influenced by a lot of this during this time. There was a lot of classical English authors. This helped elevate the prestige of English during this time as well. So we see an increase in the desire to use English as a result of the printing press and as a result of the Renaissance and the translation of some of these more classical works into English. This also prompted a lot of attempts to improve um, English and to sort of um, uh, add to what English was doing. So um, English was often compared to Latin. Latin was often seen as the sort of better language. And so a lot of attempts were made during this time period that we'll see in the other lecture about um, outer history um, that affected the way that English would end up being structured, the way that English would end up being used, the kinds of prescriptive rules that were placed on English as a result of this comparison of English and Latin. The Protestant Reformation, another major thing, also had a big consequence during this time period. So Henry VIII's disputes with the Pope was the Reformation. It separated uh, Protestants from the Roman Catholic Church during this time period. Um, Protestants believed that people themselves should be able to read the Bible. So this was when translations of the Bible into English really started to take off. Um, we do see some Middle English translations of uh, some er um, areas of the Gospel, but not to the same extent that we start seeing it during the early modern period. And so this led to a lot of translations. We had an authorized version of the King James Bible in 1616. We still see that produced um, in many ways today, although there have been many other forms of the Bible that have been produced since using more modernized language um, than what would have been found during this time period. <laughs> 
This also led to a breakdown of the church's monopoly on education. So once the church was no longer the sole source of education and educating the people, um, this was something that allowed a lot of other people to gain access to education as well. Latin had up until this time always been considered the primary language that was used for education due to the clergy, due to the uh, religious uh, people being in charge of the educational system. But during this time, new schools were set up by merchants, by other people in the gentry after the Reformation period um, that increased the emphasis on the use of English that resulted in most of a, a complete transfer of education from church to state. So this is where we start seeing public education come into play and where more people have access to being educated as a result of this sort of split from the Roman Catholic Church. When there were disputes that arose, um, they would often consult medieval church texts. This led to a rediscovery of Old English. This led to more of an awareness of English history. So this increased their linguistic and literary awareness of the history of English at the same time that they were trying to sort of expand it um, and sort of rely more on English for education, for religious purposes, for just, just about everything in everyday society. The next major thing that happened was what's something known as the enclosures. So from the late 15th to the early 17th centuries, uh, landowners started combining small land holdings. They converted them into more eff efficient pastures for things like wool. And this displaced a lot of people. Thousands of tenants were displaced. A lot of them were relocating to cities and increasing urbanization during this time. We see a very big rise in a population in the London area. Cities start becoming a melting pot of different dialects from rural areas. So all of those different, very disparate ways of speaking that we find during Middle English start intermingling in these urban areas during the early modern period. And this fostered a middle class that wanted to improve their social and economic standing. It used to be that they were sort of the noblemen and the people that were at the top, and then there was everyone else that were sort of the working class. We start seeing a middle class arise out of this during this time period. Um, and this middle class of people that were trying to improve their social and economic standing were often very concerned with the correct usage of language. So we start seeing language handbooks written during this time in an authoritative way saying, you are supposed to do this, you are not supposed to do this. People wanted these very practical rules that were easy to use, easy to memorize for ways to properly use English. And our other lecture on outer history that focuses more on linguistic awareness will dive into some of the um, results of what happened with that. During the Industrial Revolution, which also took place during this time, we start seeing this towards the end of the early modern period. Um, we see a lot of other sort of technical advances taking place. So James Watt made the steam engine practical, um, and this is often cited as the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. This led to a further increase in urbanization as well, and this also brought about a lot of additional vocabulary. So we start seeing the introduction of a lot of technical and technological vocabulary from Greek and from Latin. Um, this actually may have temporarily decreased literacy rates because children were in factories, they weren't accessing education um, at the same rate. So this actually led to a bit of a decline in the power of English, um, despite the increase in technology that was taking place. The other major thing that happened, especially towards the end of the early modern period, is this rise in exploration and colonization. And it wasn't just England that was doing this, other countries were doing this as well. But at the beginning of this period, England really only had one overseas possession. This was Calais, um, the port that was on the coast of France, just across the English Channel. They lost this in 1558. But by the end of the 16th century, England had defeated the Spanish Armada. They also became a major sea power. And during this time period, within the next 100 years, um, the Brits acquired many colonies throughout the world, places like Bermuda and Jamaica, the Bahamas, um, the Mosquito Coast, which is now known as Honduras, Canada, the American colonies, India. By the 1800s, they also had areas like Gibraltar, Australia, New Zealand, Pakistan. They had expanded around the globe. Um, by the 1800s. And so what this ended up resulting in is the spread of English widespread throughout the world, as well as an increase in thousands of loanwords from other languages that were not Indo-European languages. So as these different products were being brought to England from their different colonies, this led to an influx of loanwords for the names for what these products were. So the different kinds of spices, the different kinds of food, the different kinds of animals that they were encountering brought in lots and lots of loanwords during this time. And this also created a global spread of the English language. So we start seeing English being spoken on many different continents. It's not something that's just found in England any longer. So this is the period where English is expanding its reach and starts becoming a globalized language. And the end of the 
early English or the early modern time period is usually marked by the American Revolution. So this is something where the American colonies revolted, became a nation. We now live in that nation. Um, and this independence of the United States represented the first major political separation of English speakers from their parent country, from England. So there were English speakers that were no longer just in England that had their own independence, that had their own um, colonized areas that they were sort of using and doing their own things with. So this marks the beginning of what would become multiple different national Englishes. So we see American English, we see Australian English, we see New Zealand English, we see Indian English, we see South African English. So lots of different forms of English start developing as these other colonies sort of take off, as they start separating, as they start um, gaining their independence. And so during the modern English period, which we'll talk about after the break, we'll see how this ended up affecting the influence of English over time. So to sort of summarize some of these outer um, history changes, we see the printing and the printing press that widened the scope of English, it widened the prestige, it widened the usage, it increased English's power in many, many ways. The Renaissance led to a lot of translations, a big influx of loan words from um, other areas um, as a result of these different translations from French and from Latin. The Protestant Reformation separated church and state, so English became the language of education. So we see translations of the Bible, we see a rediscovery of Old English, we see an awareness of English history, we see an increase of English in more areas that other languages were once sort of dominating in. The enclosures did a lot to displace the population. We see a middle class start to emerge. They start to try to improve their status through language usage and linguistic awareness. We also see the Industrial Revolution adding to that urbanization, colonization spreading English around the globe. And then finally, the American Revolution ending England's hold on the language and sort of separating the language from a single political, political entity into multiple different national um, English forms. So those are some of the major things that we see um, happening during this time and some of the effects that they end up having on English as a language. As always, if you have questions, you should send me an email, schedule some office hours, bring questions to class, and we will be able to talk about them.